Whoa, look at all these people. This is pretty cool, huh? A little louder. You got it. Is this cool? Excellent. I'm Jim Adams. I'm the Deputy Director of Planetary Science, and I have absolutely the coolest job in the world. We fly by Saturn, we rove Mars, we're reaching out to Pluto every day, and it is absolutely awesome. The reason we do that is because we're trying to answer some fundamental questions, like how did we get here, where are we going, and are we alone? You guys think there's life in our solar system? Mm, uh, mixed, mixed crowd there, I'm not sure. Well, we're, we're about trying to find out whether or not there's life in our solar system. But before I start, I want to ask a question. How many of you expect to be here on December 22nd, 2012? Excellent! I get so many questions from people about that movie, 2012. You guys know what I'm talking about? People are upset about a movie. And let me tell you, NASA has gotten so many questions about 2012 that we've had to put up a special website with the facts. And so I'm here to tell you the facts before I get started. In 2012, there are no enormous solar flares predicted. There are no rogue planets on a collision course with Earth. There are no asteroids planned to impact the Earth and kill us off like dinosaurs. Um, and there's no brown dwarfs headed towards Earth that are going to scoop up our gravity and switch our poles. Let me tell you, that's fiction, it's Hollywood, and you guys that raised your hands, you need to tell your friends. Because there are people out there that are worried. So let me just tell you, in 2012, all is safe. And here's one of the reasons I know. I run the group at NASA that's responsible for tracking that stuff. And I can tell you there are no asteroids that are going to impact the Earth in 2012. But what is going to happen in 2012 is this baby is going to land on the surface of Mars. This is the largest rover, robot rover, that we've ever built. Anybody first here, first robotics? Isn't that cool? This is a, this is a robotic rover that many people from the first program actually are helping to design. It's going to land on the surface of Mars, and it's not going to land like the other rovers, you know, where they bounced on the surface of Mars in airbags and the whole thing then deflated and that sort of thing. No, what we're going to do is we're going to hover above the surface of Mars and lower that robot on a crane, and then the robot ro rover will drive away. And while it's there, it's taking some of the most um, some of the most sophisticated scientific instruments along with it in hell in, and it's going to help us search for life on Mars. That's pretty cool. And I'm telling you, I have the coolest job in the world. So do these people, by the way. Titan. Titan is a moon of Saturn. And underneath its haze, it's raining right now. In the southern hemisphere of Titan, it's raining. Titan has the o Titan is the only other body in our solar system that has liquid on its surface. And it has this hydrological cycle just like the Earth, you know, evaporation, condensation, precipitation and accumulation. You learned that probably in grade school. But it is in water that's raining on Titan right now. It's liquid methane. Methane is the gas that comes out of your stove. Methane is a product of the formation of the solar system. And why does Titan have so much of it and every other body in the solar system has so little? We don't know, but we're finding out. The Cassini probe has flown by Titan 71 times, and it's found these lakes. This one is just the edge of a lake that's the size of the Black Sea of methane on Titan. How cool is that? Mercury. Let's talk about Mercury for a second. I'm allowed to step out of the box for Mercury. 
Mercury is a puzzle. If you were to take the density of all of the terrestrial bodies of the solar system and line them up based on size, they'd make a line like this. The moon would be here, and the Mar and Mars would be right about here, and Venus would be right about here, and the Earth would be right about here. It roughly correlates to the, to the size of the planet. Their density is roughly the same, uh, correlates to the size of their, of their radius. And I tell you, based on the radius of Mercury, it should be right here. But it's not. Mercury is here. Got to make sure I don't fall off the back of the stage. Mercury is way back here, up here, the same density of the Earth. Why? We don't know. There are some scientists that think that Mercury is actually a much larger planet, and all the light stuff got blown away by the sun and left the core behind. So the core of a planet is hanging out in orbit around the sun for us to investigate. And that's exactly what we intend to do in March when the messenger probe after its six-year journey, slips into orbit around Mercury. Europa. Europa is really a puzzle. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. In fact, if you go out tonight and you look into the sky with binoculars, you can actually see Europa in orbit around Jupiter. Europa is an ice world. It has a shell that's a kilometer, multi, multiple kilometers thick, and inside of it is liquid water. In fact, there's so much liquid water inside of Europa that it's got three times the amount of water inside it than we actually have on the planet Earth. And it's less, it's smaller than the size of our moon. Well, what's up with that? How is it that Titan got methane and Europa got water? We don't know, but we intend to find out. What's also really cool about Europa is it's so warm inside that the, uh, the internal heating is making the water liquid and the oxygen from the ice surface is dissolving into the, into the water inside. Scientists actually think there might be life in there. And what's up with these brown spots? What's going on there is the ice shell is breaking and cracking and rifting and these the internals of Europa are seeping up through the surface and then refreezing on the surface, and then it's bathed in radiation. Europa is bathed in so much radiation from Jupiter that if you were to stand on the surf surface of Europa, you'd, ha you'd receive a lethal dose of radiation in just 48 hours. So one of the most hostile wor worlds in the solar system could actually be the place that harbors life. Some of the engineers tell me that the best way to look for life in Europa is with a submarine. How cool is that? That's a huge job. And you know what? Someday you guys could be involved in exploring Europa with a submarine. That's pretty cool. Hartley 2 is a comet. Let's go back to um, 2012. You know, comets have been the harbingers of doom for centuries. People would look up in the sky and say, oh, there's a comet. It must be the end of the world. Nothing could be further from the truth. These are exquisite bits of the earliest formation of our solar system, and they're there for us to investigate. So recently, the Hartley 2 comet flew by Earth, and we caught up to it with our probe called epoxy. And th uh, so that we would know where we were going, we were taking pictures of it from the Earth. This is a ground-based telescope image of the Earth. A comet is a, an ice ball, a large ice ball, kilometers big. And as it gets closer and closer to the sun, the sun melts away bits of it. Water vapor and dust start making this round ball called a coma and the long thing you don't see there called a tail. And that's what people have seen for centuries in a comet. Well, the epoxy probe saw this. That was just 18 hours out from the, the comet Hartley 2. But it's traveling at 27,000 miles per hour. 
Have you ever tried to take a photograph from a car just moving at 30 miles per hour? Do you know how hard that is? So what our engineers did was they designed a way with software to track on the comet as we swung by it at 27,000 miles per hour. And this is what they saw. You guys are seeing data that is just two and a half weeks old. Two and a half weeks ago, we flew by the comet Hartley 2, and, and it stunned the scientists that were looking at it. Number one, it's not a ball. It's shaped like a peanut. Number two, it's rough on the edges, and it's what's going on with that smooth band in the middle? And more importantly, look at the jets coming out of it. What are those jets all about? That's water vapor coming off. Now, we know that comets produce water vapor and have water vapor jets, but we've never seen them that dynamic before. So the scientists took the data to the back room, and they've been chewing on it for two weeks now, and just on Thursday, they released this picture. Oh, you can't see it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. But if you could see what's in this image, and you can find it on the NASA websites, you'd see this picture speckled with lots of little dots. And those aren't dust particles. What we found coming off of Hartley 2 is clumps of ice the size of golf balls and basketballs. Basketballs in space. How cool is that? What's, that, what's happening inside of Hartley 2 that's different from all the other comets that we've seen? We don't know. And maybe someday you can help us find out. And guess what? I have the coolest job in the world. I got to be there. Along with a hundred or so other people that made it all happen. I was actually wearing the same shirt too. That's pretty neat. I want to tell you something. Um, this is a sort of a secret as well about... Um, when I got out of college, I didn't really want to uh, work for NASA. What I wanted to do was to design cash registers. The microchip was just becoming useful. And I thought, you know, all those people that uh, are using those clunkers, they're going to need electronic cash registers. And I did not get a job working for a cash register company. And fortunately, I got a job working in aerospace. I had to go with my second choice. You know something, what I've learned after 30 years in this business is I set my bar too low. I decided that I could go off and do cash registers because that was probably, you know, I thought it was easy and it would be a fun thing to do for a while. But in fact, what I did was I decided after I got into aerospace that this was really cool and I was gonna make a career out of it. And frankly, 30 years later, I've gone from cash registers to toilets to roving Mars. How cool is that? You want to know something? You guys can do that too. Pluto. Okay. Is Pluto a planet? Uh, yeah. You know what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still there. And we're on our way to it with the New Horizons probe. You know, when we selected the New Horizons probe to be built, we didn't even know Nixon Hydra existed. And, it's, and New Horizons was launched in 2006. You recall that it took the Apollo astronauts about three days to get to the moon. The New Horizons probe was moving so fast, we're in a hurry to catch up with it. Uh, we're in a hurry to catch up with Pluto, I should say, that we got the biggest rocket we could we put this little tiny probe on top of the biggest rocket. It got out to the moon's orbit in nine hours. It was moving fast. It still, to this day, is the fastest moving object ever to leave the Earth. The New Horizons probe was launched in 2006, and right now, it's only halfway to Pluto. It's going to get to Pluto in July of 2015. And you know some of you? Some of you could be on the operations team that helps to explore Pluto and Nix and Hydra and Sharon and the Kuiper Belt objects that it's all a part of. How cool is that? Yeah. So here's Saturn. This is one of my last pictures. Saturn is this amazing enigma. You know, uh, I love this image because the sun is kind of hiding behind Saturn. 
and illuminating the rings like a halo. And you can actually see features, if you look at the high-def version of this, that you can't see in normal sunlight because of the way the sun is reflecting through the rings of Saturn. One of the interesting things about Saturn is if you were to, um, to measure the distance from the outer ring across to the other side of the outer ring, it would take 28 Earths strung together like beads, 28 Earths to go from one side of the ring to the other side of the ring. That's 360,000 kilometers. And you know what? Those rings are so lacy thin that they're not any thicker than the height of this building. It's an amazing world, Saturn is. It's got over 60 moons. It's a wonderful place for the Cassini probe to be looping about and visiting. And one of the things you can do is explore it over here on Eyes on the Solar System. I'm going to leave you with one last thought. This is not a moon. It's hard to see on, on, the, on the image, so I've circled it in, in red. That's not a moon. We're looking through Saturn's rings. We're looking at home. That's Earth from Saturn. It's a little tiny dot. And all of the things that happen to you every day are happening on that little dot. Kind of makes you feel a little small. Kind of makes you wonder, are we alone? The final thought I want to leave you guys with is, I don't have a lock on the coolest job in the world. Anybody can have the coolest job in the world. You know what? You just have to decide that whatever you're going to do, you're, gonna, you're going to change something. You're going to make a difference. And when you do that, you, you begin to have the coolest job in the world. And so I met yesterday with some high school students, or college students, I should say, that have some outrageous challenges. These folks are in special programs, and they are, they're, just, they're conquering their disabilities in ways that you just wouldn't believe. One of them said to me, he said, you know, this is only a disability if I let it be a disability. And how true is that for all of us? It's only an issue if you let it be an issue. If you let a challenge turn into a vision or a passion, then you can have the coolest job in the world, just like me. Thanks, everybody.